Let me carry your cross for Ireland, Lord. The hour of her trial draws near, and the pangs and the pains of the sacrifice may be borne by comrades dear. But Lord, take me from the offering throng, there are many far less prepared, though anxious and all as they are to die, that Ireland may be spared. Let me carry your cross for Ireland, Lord. My cares in this world are few, and few are the tears will for me fall when I go on my way to you. Spare, oh spare to their loved ones dear, the brother and son and sire, that the cause we love may never die. In the land of our heart's desire. Lord Mayor, Billy Owen Tia, Mayor of Bingo, distinguished guests, elected representatives, the Ash family and friends. Welcome here this evening. With your permission, Lord Bear, I'm just going to use a well known slogan at the start, just for the Ash family that we're here in this magnificent city hall. Irish by birth, Ash by the grace of God. My name is Deirdre, and my mother Joanna is a third cousin of Thomas Ash. My name is Claire McCarthy, I'm a distant cousin of Thomas Ash. My name is Paul Darcy. I'm an Irish artist living in North County, Dublin. And I am trying to crowdfund for a large limestone sculpture to commemorate an Irish hero from 1916. Sportsman, trade union activist, musician, teacher, community organizer, soldier, Republican, veteran of the 1916 Rising, Roman Catholic and patron. It is a fitting act of remembrance of a good man. It is not so much the case that we should remember Thomas Ash, his life, his conduct, his values, but rather, and more importantly, why we need to do this, why we must ponder the significance of that life. In this decade of centenaries, Thomas Ash stands shoulder to shoulder with all the other patriots who are being remembered and who are being uh, honoured. From where did Thomas Ash's pronounced sense of duty come? First, his family background. Thomas Patrick Ash was born in 1885 in County Kerry. He was one of ten children. He was sixth in a family of three daughters and six sons. One child didn't survive infancy. Thomas Ash was born into an Irish speaking home. His father was well versed in Irish history, he was an excellent singer and very fond of music. He was also a fluent Irish speaker. In the evenings he would share stories of history with his children. During his early years, Thomas witnessed the struggle of the small tenant farmer. I think it's important to appreciate that the famine was, was touching distance away. Um, famine, the Great Famine of 1845 to 1852, his grandparents would have lived through that. To give an idea of how bad it was though in 1880, my great-great-great-grandparents emigrated. They were, they were Ash, Johnny Ash and his wife, Catherine Ash. Um, they emigrated to the US with all, uh, most of their children, two children, emigrated to Australia. Um, and the reason they emigrated was 
things were so bad in Ireland. There was this famine and um, it must have been really grim for them to, for the best option for them to be to emigrate. They left one child because, of course, it was very important to retain land. There was always this obsession with land in Ireland. And that was my ancestor, Mary Ash. Family of ten, as I said, but unfortunately, one drowned in Menard, two children died, young children, and the remainder did their own thing. He was a beautiful Irish butcher and was a bright child who advanced quickly in school. Following his qualification in 1907 as a teacher, Tom Ash was posted to a school near his native place. He added music to his activities, learning to play the bagpipes. In 1908, he became principal of Cardiff National School of Russell in North County Dublin. And this was to be his base for his most active years. And he made a great impression there as teacher, cultural activist and militant republican. He was an active member of the Irish National Teachers Organisation. The Black Raven Pike Band was founded by Ash in 1910. And he led them to win the Championship of Ireland at the Raptors of Galway only three years after they were founded in 1914. And of course, this band has endured to the present day and is still one of Ireland's finest. interested in every game. If there was a ball somewhere, it was there to be kicked. If there was something to be written or something to talk about, he would do it. He was a national school teacher in a two-teacher school. He followed the syllabus, but not exactly. He found it that uh, easier to bring people to Cardiff, which was the name of the school. He brought them there to uh, entertain and to teach the children what they had learned in life. Roger Casement was out a day. I've met people who were, were whose fathers were in school the day Roger Casement was there. He had Maud gone. He had many other people come and distribute their knowledge on those children. If it was a fine day, they went out and they observed nature or they played or whatever it was. But it wasn't a strict syllabus he ever followed. He felt there was more room for others. He was very much an athlete, very much a walker. Very few people wanted to walk with him because he was six foot plus tall. And instead of walking, he strode. Great big long steps and very few people were able to keep up with him. So he was a solo walker. Then discovered that if he got a motorbike, life would be so much more simple. In actual fact, he had two motorbikes. He uh, lost one, gave away one of them to a friend and got a second one. So he was now motorised. He came into Dublin nearly every Saturday and met up with his friends. They were uh, teachers, they were Conor Lagrega people, they were people he'd met along the way and he would spend most of Saturday in Dublin, obviously Conor Lagrega, anything else and of course anything else that was of interest to him that took his time and that's what he did he was sent by Conrad de Gaelga to america now before we go too far i'll try and paint a picture of him he was a very big tall man six foot plus very athletic wore his clothes very well and liked his clothes he had a kilt which he wore with the Black Raven pipe band and it was a lovely kilt. But before he went to America, he bought two other, two other kilts to bring with them so that he would have a change. He had a moustache, but not like most of the people of 1916, he had a waxed moustache. And my father used to say there was never a hair astray on that uh, moustache. He was 
uh, a very intelligent man, very cultured, very good at music. He played the bagpipes. And my cousin tells me he used to practice the bagpipes at the top of a mountain near to where he was from in Kennard. Ash was a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and like other leading members, such as Tom Clark and Paddy Bartlett, he supported the workers of Dublin during the Great Lockout of 1913. He regularly visited Liberty Hall and met James Connolly, and wrote to his brother Gregory in the United States, We are all here on the Ireland side. You have beat the hell out of the snobbish, mean, shown in employers yet, and more powerful. He now went to America. Uh, to collect for Conrad the Bailey and he did make quite a bit of money there. My father met up with him every other weekend because my father had gone to America in 1913. We move on, so my uncle and father were both in America, having a marvellous time, enjoying themselves, meeting up every weekend, and then the rumour of World War I came the way. And they decided, at least my uncle Tom decided, he'd better go home and see what was happening. My father stayed on. So he came back to, to Dublin and back to school. And all the time there was the rumour that there was going to be an insurrection. Well, they didn't know. Might be today, could be next week. You wouldn't really know. There was nothing definite about the time. With his characteristic enthusiasm, Ash set about organising and training the men of the 5th Finger Battalion of the Irish Volunteers drawn from across North County Dublin. By early 1916, he was made officer commanding of the battalion. But eventually, they got their heads together, and Easter Monday was the day selected. What in a few tears since his life he gladly gave And no words need be spoken Or the bones of fear can break So he stood around his resting place As tearful silence fell And rifles crept like as comrades bid farewell And rifles crept like tongue As comrades bid went from Moscow into Dublin to make sure that that was going to be the day they were going to uh, start the insurrection in Lusk. He had got uh, a doctor and a priest to come to interview all the volunteers who were going in to, I suppose you could call it battle. Anybody who wanted to go to confession, they were free to go. Anybody who had somebody sick belonging to them at home, they could let the doctor know so that he could visit the house and uh, be part of what was happening. Now, Battle of uh, Lost Swords actually happened around four o'clock in the afternoon and they started to move. 20 people were sent to Linda City and the rest were something around 40, 50 people were left and they started their manoeuvres across North County Dublin. They had bicycles and that was the way they travelled. Never in a great big heap, just one or two cycles, and then a stop, a stop, and then some more cycles followed through. And that was the way they got to the various barracks. As they came to the barracks, they two or three of them would go in and say they wanted to take over the barracks. And very often the barracks, the sergeants there, yielded in to, and gave in, but they took the guns. So now, having started with not a huge amount of actual working guns, they now are collecting an arsenal. And as they moved, so the arsenal moved with them. Eventually came to Ashford. The captain of RIC Barracks, Swords, Dunaby, and Garstown, before attacking the RIC Barracks uh, in uh, Ashford, Trenton Bay, on Friday the 20th, uh, 28th of April. Now, that Battle of Ashford, he had drawn out on a piece of paper a fortnight beforehand in a house called of Bat O'Cara. 
He was a carrier man who went to America, made money, came home and started to build houses. In his house, he had a cellar. So in this house also, he drew, my uncle drew a map of what was going to happen in the Battle of Ashbourne, where it was going to happen, the battle itself, because they had runners who knew whether the army was moving or coming or going. So it has happened, that's Blashford. After about an hour, they yielded to the IRB, and so that was the end of it, until they turned around and saw behind them uh, armoured cars coming down from, I think it was Navan or Pels, I'm not too good. Anyway, when they saw these armaments coming, my uncle knew exactly what they were to do, an ambush. They were all spread out along the ground and there was to be an ambush. Now, as I said, I'm not a historian, so I'm not going there. But like yesterday, of a hundred years ago, they won the Battle of Ashburn. It was Friday, it was the same day. They won that battle and anything like their celebration was huge. Nobody else had won anything. And they did celebrate. But the biggest insult that could happen to anybody, I suppose, in their life, was that the next day they had to go and surrender to the British Army, the, the uh, British Army. And that took all the joy out of their winning of a battle. But the day after the battle of Ashford, Fierce surrender order arrived and Tomash duly obeyed. He was arrested and taken to Richmond Barracks, the first of a string of places of his detention where he would be held over the following 14 months. And he was undoubtedly a key leader in the rising. He was court martialed and sentenced to death on the 11th of May, the same day as Edmund de Valera. Avoiding execution by Edmund de Valera only because, having executed 15 men by the 12th of May 1916, the British government was nervous of international reaction, particularly in the United States. Some of those already executed, of course, had played uh, far lesser roles. Yet, following the execution of James Connolly and Sean McDermott on the 12th of May, no further death sentences were confirmed. I've just looked up at all the prisons he went to, and they are so numerous, I think I counted 10 in all. He must have been a jailbird at this stage because he was into so many prisons, England, Ireland, and various other places. Ash was moved to a major jail and before being sent to Darko Prison in England, one group of over 60 Irish prisoners. He was held there for six months and transferred to Lewis Prison in Sussex, where he spent another six months. His time in these prisons coincided with the tourney of the political time in Ireland, which I think is a very important point, as people turned in ever greater numbers to republicanism. And while the reaction to the executions, the mass imprisonments were hugely important, it should not, should not be forgotten also that the renewed threat to partition Ireland at that time was also hugely important. And what was seen as the uh, powerlessness of the Irish Parliamentary Party, Redmond's Party, uh, was also a huge factor. And uh, Thomas Ash was very close to this. This veteran of Ashburn knew that this dignified, this nurturing, this inspirational sense of duty was the greatest weapon in the arsenal of the Irish Republic, against which British artillery, British gunboats, British machine guns could not prevail. Thomas Ash was released from jail in England in June 1917 under the general amnesty that was given to Republican prisoners. On the 15th of June 1917, in the House of Commons of London, Coalition Cabinet member Andrew Bonner-Law, leader of the Tories, announced a general amnesty for all prisoners, quote, now in confinement in connection with the rebellion of 1916. The prisoners arrived at home there on the 7th of June 1917 and were greeted at Weston Road, now Pierce Railway Station, by many thousands of cheering people. But then came the time when they were released. 
and they came back to do their ordinary chores and their ordinary work. And he seemed to have gotten the name of being an orator. We must remember the signatories were all dead and gone at this stage. And there was only De Valera and himself left. So they were in demand to make speeches here, there and yonder. And for me, I attempted to kill Thomas Ashland and Stack were given a massive amount of law to come to Kerry. In autumn 1917, he was head of the IRB. In other words, he knew what was really going on. Ash's time for celebration and rest was short. From mid June to mid August, Tom Ash spoke to large crowds of vendors all over Ireland. After he was released from prison, he went back to Ireland. And I think here is what impresses me the most about him. He could have just lived out a long, quiet life. And instead, he chose to continue speaking out publicly, which he had to have known could have led to further imprisonment. He clearly chose to continue to fight for freedom in Ireland and put more importance on that than his own personal safety. We all celebrated, we were all talking about it, Caseman's big uh, celebration last week. But in 1917, my uncle had the first celebration. No newspaper would take an ad that there was going to be somebody celebrating Casement. So word of mouth went around. And how ha happened, I don't know, but thousands apparently came by foot, by, by, uh, by bicycle, by car, and what have you, to a very, very big celebration of Roger Casement's death. It was sometime in the month of August. Upon his release, he attended a meeting in Ballinalee in Longford with Michael Collins where he gave a speech and it was at that it was after that speech that he was arrested and charged with sedition. Uh, a book written the other a couple of years ago by um, Tim Pat Coogan said of course the two of them, Michael Collins being the two, the other person, of course they went to Ballinalee, weren't there two gorgeous girls there? Wasn't there Maud or wasn't there Titty? Well, why wouldn't they go to Ballinamy? Why not? But unfortunately, whatever my uncle said, he was, he had his, there was a price on his head. He came to Bat O'Connor's house, this man I referred to a little while ago. He came there and he went into the cellar underground. Six weeks he spent there until the wallpaper began to get on his nerves and he couldn't stay any longer. He left Bat's house in Donnybrook. Now, while I'm talking about this, just a little note. I was reading my books to see what was happening and what have you, and I read in the paper a fortnight ago, that house is up for sale. The house that he had done all this thing in. Now, uh, anyway, he was captured in, in the pill, at Nelson's Pillar, brought to Mount Joy. The two RIC officers who gave evidence against him actually left the meeting before his speech. A report was made, which they were shown, with the wording that was alleged to have been uh, said by Ash, and not seeing any harm in that wording, they said, yes, he said that, and to their horror, they found that he was then arrested. This evidence is from Sean McCohen, who was a soldier and a Fine Gael politician, and he was also known as the blacksmith of Bal and Ali. And he was found guilty of spreading this collection among the civilian population. Uh, his trial lasted for a number of days, and he was found guilty and sentenced to two years hard labour. Thomas Ash was sentenced to two years hard labour and went to Mountjoy Prison. Uh, in Mountjoy, uh, Ash immediately defied the, the, the prison rules because the regime there was treating the political prisoners as criminals. While he was in Mountjoy, he and other prisoners demanded to be treated as prisoners of war. Met up with Aston Stack and all the other friends and they decided that they were going to go on hunger strike, saying they were not criminals. Never were they criminals. They were political prisoners. And that's what they were. There is a quote from him which reads, quote, I am a political prisoner and I claim to be treated as such. I do not ask to be released 
but I ask to be treated differently from the pickpocket and other criminals. Clearly, his request fell on deaf ears. As a result of that, the prison authorities retaliated by taking away prisoners' beds, bedding and boots. So he was living in appalling conditions, lying on a stone-cold floor, totally in humane conditions. A decision is made to force me to hunger strikers, as had been done previously with women's suffrage containers. Two days after the strike began, uh, my predecessor as our mayor, and our mayor of Dublin, Lawrence O'Neill, visited the jail. Uh, it seemed that some concessions were about to be made, and Ash replied in words that have gone down in history, no, they have branded me brutal, even though I do die, I die by the cross. On the 20th of September, the political prisoners in Mount Joy demanded political treatment and the right of association. It was refused. Two days later, they were to smash up their cells. They were handcuffed and all the furniture, bedding, clothes, boots were removed. Some of the prisoners were practically naked. A mass hunger strike was called and the prisoners were forcibly fed. The three leaders of the hunger strike were Austin Stack, Fionnan Lynch and Thomas Ash. They allowed him to lay on a cold floor for over 50 hours. And in that weakened uh, state, he was then subjected to forcible feeding. And so on the 23rd of September, this horrific process began with liquid food being poured and punched through the tube down the prisoners' throats while they were held down and their mouths held on with brute force. On the morning of the 25th, the force feeding of Ash was botched and the liquid entered his lung. He collapsed and was taken to prison hospital and then to the nearby Mount Hospital. Now dying, he was attended by the capture priests, Father Robert and Father Russell, who had attended the 1916 years before the executions of Khomeini. Indeed, in one way, Thomas Ash could be seen as the last of the 1916 leaders to be executed. And he died, Thomas Ash died, at 10.30 at the end of the Matter Hospital on the 25th of September 1970. He died having been fed five times. At his inquest, the jury found that the prison staff had shown, quote, inhuman and dangerous operation performed on the prisoner and other acts of unfeeling and barbaric conduct. By memory inspired and by love of country fired, the deeds of men I love to dwell upon, and the patriotic glow of my spirit must bestow a tribute to the men that are gone by his gone. Here's a memory to the men that are gone. Thomas Ash was the last 1916 leader to die with British hands. This last step uh, by a botched force meeting during hunger strike turned 100,000 people who were only interested in constitutional nationalism into 100,000 Sinn Feiners. His death had huge damage to John Redmond's Irish Parliamentary Party. He really did prophesy correctly that he would carry the cross for Ireland. This cross that he carried for others was thus not a simple defeat but an enduring victory. He understood that only a participant in Easter Rising could, as he was picking up the cross for others in the very act of laying down his own life. People are very cross about what had happened. They've already lost, lost the secretaries and now they've lost another person. So they have decided they're going to do something and he's going to have a state funeral. The only thing is, he has no clothes. So they make, send a message out to get uh, volunteers to come, but they wanted a tall person because remembering he was six foot one or whatever. So between Michael Collins, De Valera and all the rest of them, they all donated their clothes to dress him up to have him at this state funeral. Funeral went to the pro cathedral for mass that evening, and then was brought back to the city hall where he lay in state. The uh, 
that lasted for two days and the, uh, he was all the time minded by volunteers. Then came the day when he was being brought home, uh, to Great to Glass Eleven Cemetery to be uh, buried. My grandfather had come up from here and he was an elderly gentleman, he was 75. My Aunt Nora stood by him and with him and they stared into a great big chasm in the uh, ground which was the prepared grave for him to be put into. Now people don't know how long it took to travel from A to B but it took a long time and possibly an hour or an hour and a half. My Aunt Nora was quite worried about her father and she called over Michael Collins who was to make the oration and she said I think you're going to have to hurry because my father is not surviving very well. So while there were some people coming in the gate of Glass Levin, there were others actually uh, standing beside the grave watching the corpse being put in, which wasn't the easiest thing in the world. Now, another little anecdote about that. When the uh, coffin was being brought, Corrigan Brothers were the name of the people who brought to, took over the, the uh, funeral, and the black horses with the big white plumes walked along Glass Nevin. Uh, there was a tricolour necessary for that coffin. They didn't have one, but into the scene came Countess Markovitz, and she produced her uh, tricolour, which was made of beautiful poplar, which was the cloth made in Dublin, a mixture of wool and cotton. It was a magnificent tricolour. I've seen it, I touched it, I held it, I know it. I knew it, rather. And that was uh, folded up in full military honours and given to my Aunt Nora, which was she was very happy to take. Funeral was over and they went back home where they were going and she still had this uh, tricolour. This funeral was the first major public event after the 1916 rebellion and was attended by thousands of people as well as armed volunteers. And Michael Collins in a volunteer uniform spoke a few words beside the grave. He said, Nothing additional remains to be said. That volley which we have just heard is the only speech which it is proper to make above the grave of a dead Fenian. Thomas Ash was 32 when he died. Why should we remember Thomas Ash? The death of Thomas Ash, the last 1916 leader. This is the real link between 1916 and the war of independence. His death features prominently in the book, The Wizard of Must Die. Look at the success Thomas Ash had in 1916 and how his tactics were employed by fighters the likes of Sean Tracy, Dan Breen, Tom Barry and Bernie O'Malley later in the War of Independence as they attacked RIC bases and used flying columns to their advantage. And she does it in Battle of Ashburn in 1916. I think it's important to say that in all likelihood uh, the continuing pressure of the hunger strike uh, would have forced more concessions from the jailers and indeed this did happen uh, after Thomas Ashley's death. And this of course happened in many subsequent hunger strikes at the time and indeed for decades afterwards. The performance of Ashley's column prefigured the tactics of IRA flying columns in 1920 and 1921. I think that his thirst for justice has continued to inspire his family today. I hope that he looks down and sees his family here in the United States, many of whom have become police officers, teachers, and other public servants, all of whom have been very politically active. The tradition of standing up for justice hasn't left us, and we are so proud to call him our cousin. In terms of how Thomas Ash should be remembered, I think he should be remembered as a very brave man, a man who gave his life for a greater cause. By his labours, doing his life in the cause of Irish culture, as well as actions and death in the cause of Irish freedom, he embodied and advanced the struggle for Irish independence. And the words that I want to say to you about tonight are the words of Nora Ash, Thomas' sister, also sister. 
And these words were spoken by Nora in September 1966 at Cordova National School. And I think these words epitomize the essence of Thomas Ashe. And who better than Nora Ashe to uh, utter those words? And I will start with them. In his person, tall and handsome, with a head of curly hair, in full act of life he led, in the vitality of the example he left for us, near vague the raw or far a Thomas Oz. He was no mean man. The vital spark of his personality was so powerful that when I came here and visited you to ask you about him, I felt as I listened to your stories and your remembrances that you were talking of a man alive and not one dead for 50 years. That was my most striking impression. The feeling that the living spirit of Tomas Oz was still alive in the people of Lust in Cordoba. This is a feeling we as a family have encountered on our travels throughout Ireland at the various commemorations in recent weeks. Tomas Oz is alive and well in the spirit of the people. But Tomas Oz was no mean man. And yet when we draw up the long and impressive list of his activities and achievements, we must not get wrong idea of him, that he was a paragon of all virtues, to be admired, but admired from a distance. No, nothing could be more wrong. He was such a man as one we were lucky to have as a pal. Luckier still to have him as a friend. He had a great sense of humour and was always ready with a joke and a merry story. He liked to visit a friend at night to chat and kill. He was a great man for fowling and liked nothing better than a long day trampling after a dog with a gun. And he didn't often come home with an empty bag. Even today, the picture of a young man riding his own bike in those far off years of 1914 and 15 and right useful that motorbike was during Easter week 1916. I have mentioned the curling hair of this handsome man. There is only one photograph showing him without it. A photo taken after his release from prison in 1917, when the prison crop had tamed for a while to carry curls. One can easily be led astray when considering this extraordinary man. In this photo, we see almost a different person. A great seriousness and a deeply thoughtful look. Now we see the deep, lying seriousness, so easily covered by the charming smile, so readily forgotten when listening to the merry joke. This was a deep thoughtfulness which made the revolutionary teacher a poet, which made the piper a dancer, a painter a pitcher, which made the footballer and hurler a writer and a critic. This was the steely core of the man, mined in Canard in County Kerry, fired in Fingal in County Dublin, tempered at Ashburn in County Mead, and sharpened in Lewis Prison in England. The well-tempered steel was tested to the end in Mount Joy Jail, and it proved true, true to the hilt. But the mark of the blade will not be worn away. The mark is as deep and as firm on the block of history. Thomas Oz was no mean man. I have tried today to give you not a history of the man and his work, but have tried to look back from the porch of his school and see the man himself as he walked with quick stride in all his rigorous manhood along this road once more. But now it is the road into history he travels. And all we can say is, Lana Imas Navini, our yes and all day, read a book of Tomasos. At an oration delivered by Tomasos at Casement Force in Ardenford and Kerry on the 5th of August 1917, Tomasos spoke about one of the casualties of Ashburn, Thomas Rafferty. His body was taken to a house in Ashburn, a 
and the woman of Mead, and the women of Mead, and heard the rifles ringing the whole day, were in the house with the body of Rome Rafferty. They stepped aside when his mother entered, trembling in fear and sorrow for the young fellow who lost his life, and for the mother, an old woman. She entered and looked at the dead body of her son, and moved the locks of hair, and looked up to heaven. She said, Thank God it is for Ireland you died. I would echo those same sentiments for Tomas Oss. He died for a good cause, and thank God it is for Ireland you died. <laughs> Die not alone in a good cause, but in the best cause, the greatest of all, the service of others. Oh 